Kia ora. Sorry that it took me a bit longer, but I had to, I had to run here, so I'm sweating a bit. Sorry. And uh, there's some technical things that um, we're sorting out because I'm also showing a video of an interview that I did with Nomadic Art Gallery, so that's why we're trying to solve that a bit. So, um, aroha mai. Um, kia ora e te whanau, o ko rem ko dublai, toko ingoa. Um, he, um, oh, there's a bit of a sun here. Um, he, kai tohu e te art space. Um, um, welcome, hara mai, um, to this third talk in this series, which is called A Base of People. Um, and um, this is the last one that we're doing. It's really great to see so many of you here. Yesterday was also a full, um, a full house, actually, so that was good. Um, what we're doing, how I've, uh, how I've designed that. Sorry, I'm not having a good day. There's this kind of uh, <laughs> glance in my... In my uh, I. How we're going to do this, we're going to do an hour talk because I also realize it's, it's, it's warm and we want to do other things as well. Um, and it's great to be uh, talking today with these three amazing uh, wahine. Um, and today we're going to talk more around collecting. I thought it was a, um, a good idea um, in the context of an art fair to talk about collecting. No? So the other two days before were more around internationality and curatorial practices. Uh, yesterday we had a great panel with Ngahiraka Mason um, and Nigel Burrell and Cameron Alo Matumua and Ashley Taupaki, which was uh, around the future and the history of Aotearoa art. And today I really wanted to talk about um, collecting and see if we can speak with a couple of people on the floor, on the, on the ground, if you will, um, who, are, who are having a kind of um, what I would call quite an interesting uh, way of, of collecting, whether that be as an, as an, as an artist in a way, um, trying to sell your work in an alternative way, or collecting um, as an individual, um, more from a sort of political context, if you will. So are there any ways in which you can collect that is not only um, for above the sofa, but um, something that really has more of a social, social context. So we'll see sort of where that, where that leads us and what that can be. So um, I've invited uh, for people that I think uh, can give us a really great insight in what that can can be. It's a bit experimental for myself, but also maybe also for the speaker. So bear with me a bit, or bear with us a bit. Um, but it's going to be hopefully um, uh, nice and, and, and a bit entertaining as well. So I'll try and uh, lead it as much as I can. Um, and what I'll ask is for the individual speakers to introduce themselves um, for a couple of minutes. Um, we're going to see a bit what we're doing because there is actually a, um, a fourth group here that we're trying to get on the screen, which is the Nomadic Art Gallery, which I did an interview with uh, just last week. So I want to show that as well. But we'll first go and introduce um, the panel. So um, thank you so much for joining. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll start. Jenny, do you want to start? I'm going to yeah. place myself yeah. there. No problem. So I just to start about. You know, briefly about my... Yes, question. yes. So, yeah, my journey. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jenny Hu. Um, I, uh, I came to New Zealand in 2003, and I'm originally from China. So, um, collecting arts is an important part of my uh, life journey in New Zealand. So it's really broadened my uh, horizon in my li uh, horizon for my life in New Zealand. So I just, you know, briefly talking about some my collection. So the first New Zealand artist works I collected is um, Max Giblet. So I bought it in 2009. And uh, this is the first piece I bought. It's one of the Silver Moon series of the Max Giblin from Gal Lansford Gallery. So, and I visited Max uh, Brooklyn studio in New York City in October in uh, 2018. And we have had a um, very good talk about his life. 
how he grew up as an artist in America, and how New Zealand, his hometown, is so important in his whole life, and how his painting was influenced by the culture of Japan and the Indian and the Buddhism. So I brought his work to the master section of the International Youth Art Exhibition in China Academy of Art in 2019. It is the first time that Max Gibler's work was shown in China officially. So I, uh, another artist, you know, I collect uh, the works I collect is, um, I collect a couple of pieces work of Vincent Ward. He is an international acclaimed filmmaker from New Zealand, but he started his painting artist career since 2000, uh, 2009, and I helped and support him to participate to the Shanghai Biennale in 2012. So this is the first time for his arts were officially presented in the, internet, uh, in the international art shows. So I collected a small piece art of the Peter Robinson. It is his very early work was made with um, mixed material like a chalks, uh, acrylic, and the glues on the paper. There are two airplanes images in a number of dollars 3.125 percentage in this work. It's very fascinating and a mystery for me. So I started to explore why behind this initial symbols in the elements in his painting. So another um, important artist, you know, uh, the works I collect is Billy Apple. In October of 2019, I invited international acclaimed artist Billy Apple to be my first residence artist in Shanghai. There, I have been working with um, Billy Apple, Mary Morrison, and our Shanghai team together for five weeks. Billy was inspired by Rui Ali's slogan, Gong Ho. Rui Ali is a well-known New Zealander in, Ch uh, in, Ch in China. So in 1938, he created the Gong Ho logo for the technician school he established in China. So Billy rebuilt this logo in his own aesthetic, aesthetic system during his residency. You can see this work at the Asian Foundation booths downstairs. So the big piece, the yellow with green and the red color. So Gong Ho work together is made by Billy, uh, by Billy Apple. Apparently, it's a very important slogan in the worldwide, world, uh, worldwide uh, pandemic period. So I bought one of the Billy's important conceptual works. It's called Tales of Gold. You know, it's also called as a gold standard. You know, it's a, uh, there is a six steel panels. Um, he made this works in 1988. So um, I'm also, you know, um, honorably found a recent published book as Billy Apple Life in the, Life in the Work, which is written by Tina, ba uh, Tina Barton. In 2003, you know, I was, a new, I was living in New Zealand. My old son was five years old. Um, now he is a student of NYU. He was back to New Zealand last year because of COVID-19. I'm very lucky to spend one year with him during a pandemic period. So one day he told me, he said, no matter what, I, uh, what occupation uh, I will take in the future, it won't be changed that he, that he wants to be living with a creative spirit and keep thinking creatively in his life. So I believe my journey of collecting arts in New Zealand has changed my life and my, family life, uh, my family's life already. So I'm Jenny, two boys' mother, living in New Zealand, living in Auckland. Thank you. Uh, Jenny. That was great. That was a great insight. And I think I'll come back um, to you later to give some more uh, to put some more questions towards you, um, especially sort of on the immigration side, I will, and, and some of the conversations that we've had before. Um, it's also great, I don't know what you think, but it, 
for me, it was also important to have somebody like you um, here because I don't think, at least I don't hear so often um, stories from collectors or individual collectors. Of course, it's also not something that maybe you expect in a sort of a public, um, to, to come up to a public stage in that sense. And it also doesn't need to be, but I'm, I'm quite curious to sort of why people, why people collect. So it's great that you, that you give that um, insight and we'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, Hannah, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, guys. My name is Hannah Kiaroni Clark, and I am actually an architect, um, but here, I guess, representing somebody at the beginning of their art collecting journey. Um, I've always had an interest in art and studied it all through school, toyed with the idea of going to art school, but went to architecture school, but it's you know, remained a big part of my life. And about five years ago, when I arrived back in New Zealand after living abroad, I started collecting art. Um, so, you know, I don't have a huge budget. Um, I'm, not, I'm more interested in collecting young up-and-coming artists. And I sort of aim to collect one or two pieces a year. Um, I, yeah, I, and it's just one of those things... It, it brings me so much joy and pleasure and it has been a thing that's connected me back to New Zealand and back to Auckland. Um, I primarily collect stuff from New Zealand female artists, but there are a few exceptions. Um, and yeah, I'm, the way I sort of look at it and why I buy art, I mean, I love it visually, but the important thing for me is, is, is the supporting of people in the creative industry. Um, it is no easy feat to make a living out of making art, but it's so important that people do. So my collecting art, like at the end product, getting having art around me is just the nice cherry on the top of the whole process, which is collecting and supporting and being part of the industry. Yeah. Great. Thank you, um, Hannah. And I think, I mean, we had a Zoom conversation before, and one of the things that I was interested in is also, of course, the, comes a bit from your architectural background, where I think you also, within, within that practice, if I can say so, and I don't know you so well, but that I know um, sort of the environment, I think, where you, um, where you operate in. And I think that, in a way, is a very, has a more social conscience to it, if I can say that. Yeah. So I, 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 was hope, I was hoping, and I think that is the case, if you see um, how you maybe um, collect um, o only female artists, for example. I think that's quite a, a, an amazing way of thinking uh, uh, better through a collection. No? So um, I, I think the social um, element uh, that comes within that kind of way of collecting, I think is very interesting. So again, we'll come back to that as well. Um, Nico, can I, go, can I go to you? I don't know if you would see yourself as a collector, but I mean, I guess the reason why I asked you to, to join us also, because I know that you have a very um, alternative way of, of, of pushing your work out in a way, no? And bring it to, to, to collections and, and, to, and to people. So, um, but I was wondering if you could introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koe. Um, tihei mauri ora. Tēnā tātou. Tuatahi, um, ko tēnei te mihi ki te mana whenua, ngāti whātua ki o rākei. Um, tēnā koutou, um, mō te whenua tūana mātou. Um, ki ngā kaiwhakahaere o Art, art Fair, ki a Remco, tēnā koe mō te tono mai ki a hau, ki te hara mai ki konei ki te kōrero. Um, ko ai tēnei, ko Nico uh, tōku ingoa, he uri a hau no te hoki a ngā whakapau karakia, ko ngā puhi, ko te raroa oku iwi. Um, ah, kia ora. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to acknowledge Ngāti Whātua um, because this is their whenua, so thank you for allowing us to be here on your ancestral homeland. Um, to the organisers of Art Fair, thank you so much for having me. Um, and to Remco, thank you for um, this tōno, this, um, yeah, this this panel. Um, my name is Nico. Um, I'm from the far north, from the Hokianga, from the north side of the Hokianga. Um, and I'm an artist. Um, I actually came to the Art Fair in 2019 um, as part of the projects. And I just come back from Hawaii where I um, was doing my masters. And I had 
Um, I've been working on learning about the practice of making ote, which is Māori bark cloth or tapa cloth, which, which you might be familiar with. And um, yeah, coming to Art Fair was quite a um, contrast from um, where I had been <laughs> and quite a big learning curve. Um, and as Remco said, I'm not, an uh, I'm not a represented artist, so that means that I don't have a gallery. And so I guess the traditional structure which is represented here is that um, artists have um, gallery dealers and the gallery um, presents them and shows them off in their best light and communicates their messages to um, a wide audience and, um, and sells their work, which is a really important relationship. Um, and uh, I guess for me, um, I wanted to do things a little bit differently. Um, I come from um, a family of fiercely independent women. Um, and I, I choose not to have a gallery um, as a political reason, because everything is political to me. What you wear is political how you wear your hair is political. Um, and uh, so I guess <laughs> I basically have exhibitions with public galleries or um, yeah, different kinds of galleries and I create a catalogue catalog and I have a long list of people who want my work and um, I send out this catalogue via email um, to 600 or so people and then it's first in, first serve. It's pretty hectic, half an hour. Um, and so that's my process. Um, but um, I, and for me, it's about self-determination. It's about tinoranga tiratanga. But it's my version of tinoranga tiratanga, and it might be different for other artists. Like, um, being represented by, by a gallery might be your version of tinoranga tiratanga, and that's awesome. But for me and my practice, which is based in ancestral practice, which is a practice that has been passed down um, for generations or um, has been stilted because of colonisation or has been lost. And it's um, a practice that has taken me hours and hours um, to learn from knowledge holders. Um, and so it doesn't really exist, in, of, to me, how, it doesn't exist necessarily in the same spaces. And I want to honour that, and I want to honour the relationship. So I, it's really important to me where my work goes and who, who it goes to, and that I get to have a connection with the person who's buying it, and that I get to maybe go and visit it if, if I want to, and that um, I feel, you know, it's, that it's, and it's always an evolving learning process as well. So everything is always changing, and, um, and I just respond to it as I see. Um, fit and um, and yeah, and it, and it might change in the future, but that's just where I am now. Um, and I know you don't necessarily know this audience. I don't know if you're an art, you're an artists or um, if you're collectors or you know what kind of things. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, what kinds of things that you want to know about collecting from from us or? or or how to do it if you're an artist, because one of the things I am really passionate about is, is creating a, an, an alternative pathway for people to come and follow if they want to, um, if, if, if they feel like it. Yeah, so, kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. <laughs> kia ora. Um, so then let's, let's ask the audience to introduce themselves, right? Everybody, yeah, no. No, 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 that's gonna take, uh, that's gonna take ages. Okay, so, um, there's, um, as I said, there's a fourth uh, introduction that I want to make. I think this gives already kind of three amazing uh, widths of, um, of, of collecting. But there's a fourth one that I want to add. So we're going to show that on the screen, which is a um, nomadic art gallery. I don't know how many people uh, of you are familiar with the nomadic art gallery, but that was a project that was... Um, that happened last year uh, by two Belgian uh, artists and curators who came to New Zealand for a whole year and toured uh, with a small van um, throughout uh, Aotearoa. 
uh, and on their way they collected um, collected works um, um, for for that van, but also for a collection. So I did a small interview with them that I'll, I'm going to play, which is around 10 minutes, I believe. And um, obviously we cannot um, we, we couldn't ask them to join by Zoom, of course, because they're well asleep at the moment. Um, they're back in Belgium, uh, but I thought it was really important um, to bring this into the mix. So, um, and hopefully, can you see it a bit on the screen? I cannot, it's a bit sunny, so, yeah, all right. Yeah, because we cannot see it, we don't, yeah. Maybe. yeah. All right, hey, um, good morning, Eugenie and Arthur. Welcome to uh, to join us here. Um, you're both from the Nomadic Art Gallery, and I've invited you to do a small talk, um, small speech, if you will, small presentation um, during these talks at the Auckland Art Fair. Welcome to join us all the way from Belgium digitally. Um, everything is well over there. Everything is fine. It's fine. Although the, the, the COVID is a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit like, yeah, not like in New Zealand, but we are you all can facing see them in the, the right same corner pandemic. There. One millimeter. Are, are fine. Yes. <laughs> yes, we're very happy to uh, be here. It's right. going to change. It's gonna so change. the reason why I invited you, because I'm doing a whole series of talks here at the Art Fair, but I really wanted to have a look at sort of new ways of collecting in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so I've invited a couple of panelists that give us different views on how that uh, how that might work. Um, and I thought, obviously, I was aware of the Nomadic Art Gallery project that you did last year, um, which I think a lot of people have followed. Um, and I thought it would be really great for you to um, introduce the project and for us to speak a bit about how how this could be an alternative way of, of uh, collecting and, and thinking through um, discovering um, uh, artists, right? So maybe if you can um, can start um, your short presentation and I'll, I'll ask some questions at the end, then um, we'll, get, we'll get underway. Perfect. Thank you so much, Remco. Um, good afternoon, Auckland. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure to be here uh, today with you, although at a distance, because as Remco said, we are in Belgium. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be at the Auckland Art Fair at a distance. Um, as you said so well, we have um, conducted a project in the year uh, 2020. Um, but however, let's start with the beginning, who we are, what we're doing, and uh, where we're going next. So who are we? We are, uh, I'm myself, I'm Eugenie. And I'm Arthur. So we two Belgians um, momentarily um, in Brussels. Uh, we, we've both been very active in the, in the art scene, especially for the last two years. Uh, but Arthur has been much more active than I am because he's been, a, he's been an art consultant and he's been an exhibition maker. Uh, and I'm more, during the project, I was more like the, the communicative uh, person. But so we've really been like a team. So Eugenie will do the presentation, most of the presentation. <laughs> Okay, and so you may not have seen our faces, but you've probably seen our truck because our truck has, uh, has put quite some attention uh, over the last year. This was an article that appeared uh, yesterday, actually, on the, on the Wahiki Weekender, and uh, the, it said, keep on trucking art on the move, which is actually, it, it actually captures quite well what we've been doing. Um, however, before delving into, into the core of the subject, let's first start with how uh, we've been funding our project and how this has been made possible. So um, our project would not have been possible without the amazing, amazing crowdfunding platform Boosted, uh, which has been absolutely amazing with us. We conducted two crowdfunding platforms, uh, two crowdfundings, uh, of which one has been also backed by the Arts Foundation. So we would really like to thank the Arts Foundation for their generosity. We'd also like to thank uh, the private parties that, has, uh, that have supported our project, both in Belgium and New Zealand, because this has been a project of many. So the project. So the project consists of uh, a truck as a public artwork, as an exhibition space and in extension of those two as uh, a collection. And so it connects a plurality of visions, which is in a sense necessary if art wants to be reflective of a larger context. So 
during our project, we got a lot of questions. So what, what does the truck really stand for? What are you guys doing? What, what is it? So in essence, our project is a, refl a profound reflection on authorship, the means and, and sites of artistic production, the promotion, circulation, and reception of aesthetic practices, the institutions of art, and the relation of all this to the social, political, and economical situation of a country in, in Concreto, New Zealand. Um, I think we lost, oh no, we didn't lose. Ah, Remco. we didn't lose uh, Remco. Uh, <laughs> so the first part of our project is um, the truck as a public artwork. It's uh, an, an unusual collection of 106 artists, artists we, which we have been uh, selecting and inviting to add their visual mark on uh, the truck. And every time an artist in, well, all of the many places in New Zealand added their visual mark on the truck. We made a video of them making that work. So we will show you a short fragment of how that looked like. <laughs> So, yeah, as, as you can see on this photo, um, we all know that 2020 stands uh, for the year COVID struck the world. So generally, our, the art on the truck uh, is also a, a reflection of the time, place and the context in which it was created. And so, of course, the COVID is uh, undeniably part of the truck, which was, of course, not really predictable. Um, but some of you may ask uh, yourself the question, how does this relate to a collection? How does this relate to the topic of the presentation? But actually, when you look at the truck on itself, on its own, the truck is actually a collection of physical connections between 106 artists that didn't know each other, that may have never met each other, that may have never worked together, but through this public canvas, they managed to be part of one Whole. So um, this brings us to, the, the, to a very core point of the truck, which is uh, the relational aesthetics of the truck. Basically, all the works are interrelated with one another. Every artist built it further upon each other's works uh, without, uh, without having seen each other um, physically. Uh, also, another very important point of this truck is its accessibility. And that's really a, a, a strong point of focus of our project, we want it to be as accessible as possible. Because sometimes uh, one may think that art has become a little bit inaccessible, especially, especially uh, because of all the, the, the academic um, component of art nowadays. Some may even question how far art is art without a sort of academic, um, academic um, surrounding. So in, in essence, our, our truck also really questions the autonomy of art and how far art exists independently of its environment. Um, and in a way, uh, our project has also been a bit of a, of a social experiment. Um, of course, we've, we've, we've been contacting tons of artists and it was a bit of an interesting, um, an interesting insight to see how artists would react to our um, question whether or not they would like to be part of our project. And we actually could see, in, uh, we actually question how far are artists really free in their creation because sometimes they may have been a bit scared of um, the association with a truck because you know, how far is a truck art? So this is a little, uh, a little preview, a little snapshot of our truck, um, 106 artists which can now be uh, visited at the Connell Bay Sculpture Park on uh, Wahiki Island. So we're very grateful to John and Joe Gao, who, have, um, who, have, um, who, who are willing to host the truck for a period of 16 months. And so, as I said, 16 months, uh, of course, given the nature of our project, which is a nomadic project, what we really hope is that the truck is going to live its own life. And we want the truck to see the whole of New Zealand in the same way as we want New Zealand to see the, to, for the whole of New Zealand to see the truck. And so that's quite a, a very nice quote that we read uh, yesterday, um, said by a trustee of the Arts Foundation, who said that I feel in the future the truck could be important for New Zealand art. It captures a space and time, and then there is the COVID connection. There are many artworks which reference that. Who knows where the truck will end up? Maybe Te Papa? So 
that brings us naturally to our second part, our second aspect of uh, what we have been doing. That is the truck as uh, a support structure for pop-up exhibitions and public performances all around New Zealand. And uh, our aim was to challenge people's perception uh, about art while reshaping the boundary, boundaries between art, uh, our daily lives and the environment. So in total, we organized 16 exhibitions uh, from Auckland to Hamilton, Wellington to Nelson, Christchurch to Dunedin. And because of our, the fact that our truck is so accessible and also because it's an ephemeral project, we decided to divide those exhibitions into uh, teams connected to life. Um, also, we were very blessed, in a sense, by uh, the pandemic, that it brought together uh, collaborations and uh, that we could fill a certain void with uh, new exhibitions uh, with artists from spaces like Blue Oyster uh, in the Neden, with uh, Hamilton Garden Arts Festival, with different venues and festivals that we collaborated to share our uh, love for art and uh, to really emphasize shared opportunities and net networks and as we approach a very broad definition of uh, art we decided that we also wanted to focus on a, a, a program based on the performative arts and next to of course a more conventional traditional or, uh, traditional programming and so this brings us to the, the core of the, of the discussion, which is another uh, side of the project. So we had the collection of the truck, and then we have uh, the collection, which is an extension of the project, a physical collection in a private collector's house. Um, of course, we'll give you a short preview of that collection, although uh, you will be able to discover the collection in more detail in the upcoming Australian art collection issue that is in March. Yeah. It's a very short glimpse. <laughs> it's a very short glimpse. <laughs> but so what makes the, the collection so special? Um, basically, the collection is, is to be seen as one whole, because um, every artwork in the collection, of course, is connected to a team from an exhibition that happened inside the truck. Um, another very important element, which uh, differs the collection from any other collection um, that we've seen so far is the, the fresh eyes perspective, which is also what the collector really liked, is the fact that we came from Europe. We um, were not conditioned uh, by anyone. Um, we were not affiliated to any, any venue, any gallery. We really sort of followed our heart and um, looked at art without being bound by any uh, preconditioned um, mind. Uh, so in a way, we didn't have to, 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 to please anyone. So it was a sort of self-declared legitimacy. Uh, we decided what we found to be, to be good art or to be uh, fitting within our exhibition teams. And of course, uh, the, the, the collection was a product of a lot of research because uh, we conducted a lot of research, uh, both online and offline. Um, I think the offline aspect should not be underestimated because we, uh, we've been meeting with tons of artists, we've been going to many exhibitions, we went to lots of galleries, museums, um, and so yeah, it was, a, it was a product of a lot of, uh, a lot of research and uh, infiltration in the art scene in every different region that we went through. And so of course, Renko, you asked us uh, whether we have a new model to propose uh, our model uh, is, is, is our starting point of the model is of course public art because it all started uh, with the truck and that's the core element of our story and of the collection uh, and also through our truck we actually um, realized the importance of public art and the need of physical connection uh, of the public uh, to, to feel sort of connection connected with the art not only through the online but actually through the offline uh, environment. So I, we, we really feel that the offline is still as important or uh, even sometimes more important than the online sphere. Um, and so basically through our project, we propose an active 
mobile and collaborative attitude in which we question the traditional top-down method of assigning value and breaking hierarchy. So basically, through our truck, through the mobility of our truck, um, not only as a marketing strategy, but also it really functioned as a social catalyst. We managed to, um, to reach a much broader audience by going places, by meeting people, um, and also we really felt the, the, the strong need for artists to also connect with other artists and to actually feel part of a broader community because sometimes that's something that we, we may forget, uh, that not only it's important to network with collectors, but also for artists to connect with other artists. Yeah, and the new model consists actually out of conducting a, a public art experiment, uh, as in an, a, a mobile form of transportation, uh, doing exhibitions within that environment or with that mode of transport, and on the basis of those two, sort of create a collection of that. So there is a public art aspect, there is an, an sort of an exhibition aspect, and there is a, a more traditional side to it, the, the uh, really basing our collection on what we find during those uh, Sort it's sort of, of a, a triangle relation between all those different aspects of the project, which which is really the, the which has been the strength of our model, let's say. And so yeah, for now, as we have uh, said, our truck can be visited at Connell Bay Connell's Bay Sculpture Park. So yeah, please get in touch with uh, John and Joe and mm -hmm. look at their magnificent uh, sculpture park. There are some thirty five sculptures, and yeah, you can't miss the Nomadic Art Gallery there. Uh, we are also busy working, like putting all the elements of the project together in a, in a book, which will come out uh, at the end of this year. And we are also busy working on uh, the launch of a European online platform dedicated to promoting uh, New Zealand art and in later phases, other uh, art from other countries where we would conduct a similar project on a similar model. Uh, and so that it comes to the future, because yeah, yeah, what what we found out with uh, with this project is actually that the world is our oyster, and that um, yeah, this project can actually be uh, extrapolated to other parts of the world, um, and we hope to be able to to of course um, uh, involve other artists in that project um, and later on on our platform. So please, uh, if you have any questions, just get in touch on our website, and then you can follow our our our. our on our social media. All right. Thank you, guys. They don't hear me, of course, but yeah. Um, can, you, can you come back again? Um, yes, I was a, sorry, it was a bit performative, but I thought it was nice to, to have their, their voice in, no? So um, I'm asking a couple of questions after this. So I was wondering, um, I'm going to come back to everyone here. I think one of the things that I was struck by also the last two days in our other panels um, was really around, and I, I kept also coming back to Nomadic, but I hear all the three of you also talk about it, um, is really around this idea of relations, right? So the shaping of relations. So of course we think that the art fair here is all about um, objects, but of course it's not. I mean, we're, we're actually finally we can meet each other, right? So, the, And it's one of the only opportunities within um, the contemporary art world in which we can actually en masse meet up, right? So again, that's a kind of very basic idea of relationships. I was wondering though, that if, if you think about collections, and of course, always you think about the object-based reality of it, how much is it actually about relations? Because Nico, if I look at you, for example, it is definitely about that, no? I mean, going out through Instagram or through your emails, I think one of the most uh, most obvious things that you want to get out of it is 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 human relations. No, is that is that? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I definitely work in the currency of relationships and whakafanaungatanga um, ki roto i te ao Māori kotena. Yeah, that's like the centre of our um, how we relate to each other and how we our genealogical connection to the land or to people or um, to to place. Um, so I think in terms of my work, I think Instagram is a really amazing way to connect with um, people, um, to have conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, to um, to kind of have access to artists. 
Um, but always keeping in mind that Instagram is just this uh, tool that may not be around forever. And so how can you, I'm always thinking about how can you make, make these like long lasting connections um, beyond just the screen. And so, I mean, that's where getting people's email addresses is really important so that you have that like long term connection and then meeting, do, you know, doing events and meeting people in person is like also really, really important and um, um, something that I really enjoy doing. Um, I'm not sure if that re relates. Yeah, no, sure, no, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Hannah, how is, how is that for you? Is it also, I mean, your collection, as you s explained to me, is also, it's relatively small, right? But is, it, is that something that you're also mostly interested in? Yeah. It is. I think um, like that is why I'm drawn to art in the first place, is that it's, it's these artists putting out work that's an example of like, their, their human experience. They're really bon that I think there's a certain vulnerability with artists putting the work out there and asking people to look at it or engage. And, and I think that's why we're all drawn to art. It sort of emotes something in us. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I I just think it's it's so it's so important. <laughs> and and um, Jenny, you also have a space, of course, that you physically use in order for people to, to so that people can meet actually, and um, and you show art there as well. How how does that work for you? Is that also? I mean, I just keep coming back on the thing that you talk a lot about as being an immigrant into in Aotearoa and always having some sort of modesty or you always want to try to uh, get to know what's happening of course in Aotearoa. Is that also a way for you to first and foremost connect with people? Yeah, um, I really agree with you because you know, I think arts is not only works in objects. So I set up the space, it's not just a physical venue. It's more about, you know, you set up the people, I set up the connection with people. And for me, the arts is not only objects and the works. I really interesting about the creative, inspiring life behind the works. I think, you know, the artists just, you know, um, spend their energy their life, their, ta uh, their time in their life to, um, uh, to make this works. They just try to express their, uh, you know, what they're thinking and the, what they uh, what they're a beautiful, you know, uh, their beautiful spirit. So, and uh, comparing with the objects and uh, the investment on arts, I'm more interested about the creative and the sensitive and the spiritual life behind the works. So uh, no matter I, you know, bought the uh, arts and I set up the space and I set up the art journey for artists, it's all about the people, about life, about, you know, the creative spirit. Because I think, you know, artists, uh, it's a group of uh, people, they are more sensitive. They are, you know, just uh, sense a lot of things um, earlier than, you know, uh, our ordinary people. So you can read a lot of things, emotion, in information, and the, their knowledge about this world and about the people in their life. So I think, you know, the arts can bring lots of things if you want to go deeper and you want to dive in deeper about, you know, the artist. You know more about and you will learn more about from other people's life. Mm. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, I thought I'll, I'll make it a bit more kind of political, if you will. Um, and Nico, maybe maybe I can start with you. Also, kind of responding to maybe how somebody like like you, Hannah, is is wanting to collect um, female artists, for example, right? How how important are those kind of considerations or motivations? Do do you think, Nico? Also, maybe not only responding to female. Um, uh, collecting only work from female artists, but also I, I, I know uh, I, that, you, you, that you would have a similar approach um, where you would say other, other people that consistently only for a political reason or for any, I mean, as you say, any reason it, it, it can be political, but um, that collect only um, uh, Maori art, for example, right? So. Um, it, are these kind of considerations actually in these times um, more important than they have ever been? 
or not? Yes, um, that's a good question. Um, so, quite hard to answer. Um, I intentionally exist on the periphery um, because that's where I want to be and I want to um, kind of present that as a pathway for other people to follow that it is possible and that I think it's quite common to, to aspire to have a dealer. Um, what if it was to aspire to not have a dealer, you know? Um, what if that was a, a different way of approaching or a different goal that you might have? And if that doesn't exist in front of you, bef before you, then how can you aim for that? And um, in terms of, um, yeah, um, my work is political, political because it's, I use natural fibers and I use plants and I use earth pigments and everything I have to harvest and um, in order to learn how to use these materials I have to have long lasting relationships with people and um, all of that time accumulates into one work um, and all of those relationships are in a piece and I want to honor those relationships um, and that time spent um, and, and, and I feel like because I'm so intimate with all of those people I should be the one to tell that story um, and I don't need someone else telling that, that story and I think that's really important if you're an artist is to know, this, know your story um, um, know we who you, like your positionality in relation to the political climate, um, where you stand. If, like I'm quite comfortable on the periphery. I was like brought up to be there. Um, so, but you don't have your, that's not your space. That's fine. Just know your positionality. Know oh, I'm a I'm a female. I'm Parker, and I'm an artist, and I'm really into this thing. And just be really staunch about who you are. Um, because there's no one else that can deliver that work to the world. And if you're confident about that, um, that is political in itself just by, um, um, by being okay and being um, validating yourself in a world that's constantly trying to <laughs> um, make you buy things just to make you feel better, you know? So if you know who you are and where you want to go, then then that's political in itself, and um, that's a decision, and you, you can make art from that, that place, um, yeah. And, and Hannah, is that for you, and does that work in a similar way? I mean, also you working as an architect, which obviously you need to be aware of social um, in, environments very, in a very direct way, um, and I think also the work that, that, that you do is actually uh, more invested in it than maybe other um, architects, do you see a clear relationship between your work and, and, and the thing that you do in your collection? Is that, yeah? Yeah, I actually thought about this a bit more yeah. after we talked about it. Mm. I do, so I work in housing, building like multi-unit housing and more affordable housing and that is really meaningful to me. I guess the thing that makes my blood boil is inequality and this growing wealth divide and I think both the housing market and the art world show that growing gap, you know. People can come here and blow like 80 grand on a piece of work, which is somebody's house deposit. Anyway, blows my mind. So um, I, and I think that's also part of the reason why I collect women, female works is there's obviously a clear inequality between men and women still in this day and age and pay and things, which is maddening. Um, yeah, and in, and in the art world, you know, artists aren't paid enough. All the meaningful professions aren't paid enough. And <laughs> all of the money, yeah, ones that are less important are paid too much, in my opinion. So, yeah. <laughs> Jenny, is that something that you can re relate to as well? I mean, I know that you also have a particular interest, for example, in, in, in uh, bringing Chinese art here or... but. Do you, do you connect to those kind of social questions as well? Or, or do you come from it in another angle? How would you respond to, to something like, like that? 
I mean, also the word, I mean, the, of the things that I know that you're interested in, to me, it reads, if, if I very, glan if very quickly glance at, there is also this, in there is this interest in, in that kind of social environment, no? Um, I think it's a quite a straight and a simple uh, explain your question. I just think, you know, because lots of people ask me, so uh, why you do some ambassador or the bridge between China and a Chinese new artist and a New Zealand artist? So um, in my past, you know, in, uh, you know, life in New Zealand, because I experienced a lot in my, you know, realistic life and also experienced a lot with my uh, you know, art collecting journey. So um, I just feel, you know, the Western culture and the Eastern culture, it's uh, so different. And uh, the value, it's so different. Sometimes, you know, it's um, quite opposite. So I just you know, talked to my friends at lunch today and uh, I told him about, so uh, have you heard about yin and the yang? So I feel, you know, Western cultural in a value is more, you know, belong to Yang, you know, the Yang uh, side. And uh, Oriental cultural in a value is more belong to the Yin, you know, side. Because, you know, um, so this is, you know, the whole word. So we have a Yin and a Yang and we got a balance. But maybe we share the same value in the core, but actually we have a so different Exp uh, expression, you know, and uh, so different understanding on, on the, in the communication. So that's, I feel this is my interest and uh, this is my passion. I just want to let some Chinese audience to understand the, um, you know, the arts from New Zealand artists. And I also very have a big passion to that New Zealand, New Zealanders to know more about Oriental you know, arts and uh, uh, to to appreciate uh, to appreciate the, be the, the beauty and the, uh, aesthetics. You know, different uh, uh, you know aesthetics. You know, system from you know New Zealand. So I feel you know um, quite. Uh, I feel really achievable. You know, uh, during I am doing the amb am, am being an ambassador between the New Zealand. Uh, arts and uh, Ch Chinese arts. So I hope I can carry on doing those things. It's, you know, very fascinating and uh, uh, give me a big passion and a satisfaction. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. But I, I just want to go back to that in idea of inequality because I think that's something that I think we should talk about in the, in the framework of, of the art fair for sure. I mean, of course, because we're now in a reality where because of COVID, of course, nobody can, can, can travel. We're uh, sort of locked in paradise. And now uh, much of the, of, of the money that otherwise would be spent in different ways would now be spent on, uh, on art, for example, right? Or, uh, or on other things. But uh, in a way, if you could respond sort of more towards what the future uh, might bring for a place like Aotearoa especially, what, what are the... What are, the, what are the things that we can think of? I mean, maybe, maybe collecting or the, or, the, or the environment that we are now in here uh, perhaps hold little value to that. But is there a way that we can kind of think, uh, think that through? What is the, um, what's going to happen in the, in, in, in the future, um, do you both think? So can, you, can you respond to that? I mean, is there something especially around sort of Aotearoa that, that could... That could um, help us think through this idea of inequality um, a bit better? Are the systems that you're both using on a, a might be an a individual modest level, could, are, they, are they helping us out? Um, so just with, when you're talking about the thing, what you've just said, it has me thinking. I think that there is like a real gap um, in, the, in the market of buying art for young people with smaller budgets, but, but there are works there that people just, I don't know, I think they're not really, there's not a lot of young people engaging with it, I don't think. Um, I think Instagram is awesome, and that has really, I love looking at stuff and keeping up with artists there. Um, but, you know, I just, there's, there's something, education to be had or something about like value, because I know people would spend, you know, the amount of work 
the amount of money it costs for a small piece of art on their like summer outfits for weddings or something, and it's just like a, a value system thing. Um, but then, you know, you come to this art fair and, and it's awesome. Um, I really love it here, but it's definitely not targeted at younger people. Like, it's very expensive. The wine's expensive. They're selling oysters. I just, yeah. I think there is a room and a space. You know, there are some programs I know where people do these, I think it was, a, is it Parlour Projects? They do these, col mm. you can collect with a group. Yep. Um, but there is, there is room for it. And, and like you said, there's a whole lot of young people here too who can't travel and probably have some disposable income and would be interested in supporting the arts if, if they could. So, yeah. if they knew they could. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm going quite a different approach. Um, in that art making, um, as an indigenous artist, um, where my work is grounded in indigenous knowledge systems, which is obviously tied to the environment, um, that research uh, is the solution for the cl climate collapse. So I feel like the work that indigenous artists are doing is really important because um, we're knowledge holders of this land, this land, Tamaki Makoto, where we are, there is stories about this place that is so unique and, and go back generations that we don't know anything about because we haven't engaged with the, with the people from here. And so all of that knowledge is, is what we need if we want to make, create solutions um, for cities or create solutions for our marae, all that Ma Tauranga is there, and that's and as an artist, I am, I'm lucky to be able to investigate that, those knowledge systems, um, and expand, you know, my own understanding of, of where I am, and um, so in terms of collecting, when you're collecting Indigenous artists, you're you're supporting that research, you're you're supporting the continuation of their practice and. Um, validating, um, you know, a value system based on whānau, hapu and iwi, on um, whanaungatanga, on um, hononga ki te taia, on um, connect, connect, connecting to the environment. And, and um, we say that the final project of colonisation is um, environmental collapse. And so how can we stop that from happening? You know, well, you know, we need to think about solutions and we need to think about empowering indigenous people and their knowledge systems um, and drawing attention to them so that we can make these solutions. Yeah, so you would have a very wide advocacy for using all kinds of indigenous uh, knowledge systems on every level, no? So whether that, so you could actually use that as a collector, but you could use it as an artist, you could use it as being whatever, right? I mean, we had Tim Melville here in the first panel two days ago, and uh, I mean, as you know, as you might all know, he's a very big advocate for bringing that knowledge. It's really not only about objects or selling art, right? I don't think, in a way, Tim is actually really completely interested in it, no? I think this is kind of, and I really value, I, I value that a lot actually. I think kind of, again, it's about the relationships. It, it, it came back in that, in that conversation as well. It came back to this idea of relationships and wanting to bring to the front different stories, um, not different actually, the kind of stories that need to be told, right? Whether they not have been seen or whether they have not been seen enough or whether they are completely, uh, uh, for many people, maybe a kind of completely new um, exercise. But they tap into directly the things that you talk about, um, uh, Nico. And I think it's an amazing, um, I think it's actually one of the best um, stands here in, in, in the fair. Um, and I think Tim is sweating all over because he has a lot of attention. Uh, I've, seen him, I've seen him sweating uh, more than I ha had when I arrived here. So, that, and that's great, that's great, great to see, no? Um, Maybe what I think, I think we're sort of on the time, we're running a bit, uh, we're running a bit uh, later. So maybe what I would love to do, and um, let, let's not make this into an awkward silence, but that's coming, uh, that if there's questions from you, please do so. That's now the, it's now the time. Um, and if there's any questions for anybody uh, who are, who's, who's here on the panel, please do so. Um, 
they're going to be gone in five, ten minutes, and then there's, there's, there's n yeah, okay, great, 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 great. <laughs> Um, I suppose this is predominantly for Nikar being the artist, um, is around secondary markets. So you said you really love that connection to your collectors, but um, how do you, when it then, you know, have you had instances where it moves into the secondary market and how, do you, how does the artist get recognition for that? Like, for example, the, on the NFT um, digital, um, there's, there's the opportunity for, that. currently they do it in Bitcoin where the, where the artist gets 10% back every time there's, um, when it's on sold, yeah. so there must be models, but I just wondered yeah. what your thoughts are around that. You know, that's such a funny question because I only, um, the secondary market is a word that only came to me like literally two weeks ago or something, so <laughs> I was like, so, haven't even considered it. I'm so fresh to this game, um, to all this, you know, I've only been doing this for a very short time and I've, I'm just learning on the fly constantly. Um, although Bob, oh, um, um, one of the teachers who was talking about secondary market, he said that one of his colleagues bought back all of her work that was on the secondary market, and that was her strategy. Um, as for me, I don't even, I don't think that anyone's resold my work. I've only been selling my work for two, or this will be my third year, so I think it was quite soon, but yeah, that's... A, something that I'll have to consider as I go on, but you yeah, have no idea, to be honest. If you have any suggestions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. 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 I definitely have got a lot of my own pieces. Yeah. And my family has a lot of pieces as well. So, yeah, so that's a thing. My family have a, actually a lot of my work. Yeah, um, and like discounted friends and family. Yeah. Like, so that they're there yeah. Those yeah, there. a lot of my work I know is staying. They'll never sell it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That was a great question. Um, I'm sure there will be more great questions. Yes. Kira, thank you. Uh, this certainly isn't a great question, and it's more of a uh, muddled observation as I've listened to, to you all speak. Um, Kia ora, and thank you uh, for sharing your work and passion with us. Um, I've been hearing from the various speakers about the um, connection, the relationships um, that are drawn from art. Also, um, obviously, this talk is about collecting art and accruing our own collection, um, if we're fortunate to be able to do so. Um, and then we've recently turned to inequality and uh, the ability to buy a nice bit of art or not. But what occurs to me, and it's again, it's not a question, it's perhaps an observation that I put to you, in encouraging people to privately collect art, isn't that feeding inequality? So if I can come somewhere like this and view these beautiful artworks that hopefully they all sell, um, they will end up in private homes. Um, so I don't get to see them anymore because they're sitting on someone's wall. But if I can go to the Auckland Art Gallery or other smaller galleries, perhaps community galleries, and view the art, that's lessening inequality because I don't need 80 grand to drop on a painting. I can see them in a public space. And the narrative around the pictures, uh, not necessarily pictures, sorry, the art, um, can be con controlled to an extent as much as it ever can by the artist, because uh, they may be curating the works or putting panels up. But I guess the observation, the very muddled observation um, I make is, isn't the very fact of private collection um, helping inequality? Because all, all these beautiful works end up on someone's wall and put starkly I can't see them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I can have a go at answering that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Do you? Oh. It seems as if the focus, as you say, has been on private collectors. Um, nobody's talking on behalf of an institution. And of course, we're all in the context of late capitalism, so inequality is bound to be a major project. But something I wanted to ask about everybody's talk, talked about contemporary art and the importance of relationships with the artists, and many of whom do enjoy that contact with the collector, and the collector very much um, gets a deeper insight into their practice.
but not all collectors and not all artists um, feed off that kind of relationship. It may be important for many, but not for all. And what about historical art, the art that people collect and institutions that, who collect historical art where, okay, you might want to learn about that artist's life, but you're not going to um, you know, be involved in interaction with them. There so seem to be other areas to do with collecting, which it would be interesting to hear more about. Um, I'll just go back to that first comment. I guess um, that it's a good point, but artists need to sell work to be supported, you know, and yeah, like I guess it's really nice as people grow older and they can um, donate their collections back to the public, but that, that's sort of where I'm seeing it is that it, I'm not collecting it to keep it private from everyone else, but to support and, and although galleries buy a lot of, or, you know, national galleries buy a lot of work, it, I would not say it's enough to support all the artists around. Yeah. Yeah, just, I mean, I, mean, I, might, I might be able to, to add a bit to that public question. I think one, I mean, there's also institutions and organizations walking around here, of course, but it's, it's, it's that would buy art. Um, I guess there's also, I mean, looking towards the history of museums, especially, uh, many of them, um, I'm, I'm less familiar actually with the, the Aotearoa scene in that sense, but have started as private collections. So that is also kind of a relationship or kind of a history that needs to be broader understood, I think. If you then talk about the relationships maybe between uh, an artist that's no longer there, for example, it's more, maybe more the relationships between um, Curators or or, or uh, conservators, for example. So that could that could be that could be um, a thing. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. I I, I do um, believe that that's another that's an all uh, there's a whole different um, ball game, I guess. And yesterday we spoke a bit briefly about it. That was more around organizations and institutions, much more on the temporary side of it, not necessarily land collections, but yeah, um, I think you're right, because especially there in the public realm, of course, it surfaces more. Yesterday, there was a, um, I think one of the questions that yesterday came up within uh, Nigel's conversation was obviously how many of the works of Toy to Toy Ora are now being uh, collected by the Auckland Art Gallery. Well, I can give. Well, I, I uh, unfortunately uh, the um, the answer to that is not so positive. So um, that's that's uh, that's that gives you a bit of a of a sense where we are at here in in Aotearoa. So yeah, um, yeah. Maybe Jenny, would you have something to say about that is that do you also work with a more publicly related like I'm just thinking back coming back to your to your advocacy or, or being an ambassador do you work with public collections as well or or, or advise them in a way because um, you know um, I just try to set up the quality uh, platform for a New Zealand artist and a Chinese artist and I think in an institution, in a public art gallery, always a very important panels, you know, in this uh, area. So, um, yes, I, I, you know, keep a very good connections in the relations with uh, some public art uh, gallery in New Zealand and in China. And also, I just, you know, try to set up some program with. Uh, like China Academy of Art or Shanghai Academy of Art, some institution like this, because you know, I think you know the public art gallery and the, the uh, some art institutions they always play a very important leading and uh, um, uh, like solid solid stone in you know, in the river. So I think it's quite important. Of course, you know, the private collections is very big uh, proportion in New Zealand art industry, but I think, you know, the institution in the public art gallery is, they play a very key role in, in it. So um, this is my personal yeah. opinion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. All right, if there's um, no other question at the back, yeah. Um, hello. Yeah, I wanted to ask about pretty much what do you think that Eastern values 
and Western values coinciding can bring to each other, like how by bringing Chinese art to New Zealand and making like New Zealand people see this art, what will they gain from it? So you're talking about how to consolidate the, you know, aesthetic, you know, between the East and, and the West, is that right? I'm talking East the arts I'm and the uh, West art, Western artist. I'm talking about what can it bring each other, like what okay. benefit? Uh, what can they bring each other? So I think, you know, uh, it's quite, as I say, it's really opposite, because when I bring some Chinese uh, artist, you know, works here. So the the local audience just say, ah. Um. So they feel not familiar. So if I bring some, you know, the New Zealand artists like Mike Skiblet's works and uh, the Colin Marquez works to uh, China Academy of Art, and they say, ah, um, okay, this is a Chinese art, uh, this is a New Zealand art. I think it's really important things, you know, what I'm doing is just to try to use this uh, uh, program to open people's mind. So for, uh, you know, for New Zealand audience, if they can open mind, they can appreciate the different, uh, you know, the arts from, you know, the Eastern uh, system. If for Chinese audience, if they can open mind, they can appreciate some different elements from New Zealand, you know, the art, uh, you know, system. So this is all about open mind, opening your mind and uh, try to understand each other. So this is, you know, some meaning behind arts appreciation, arts program. So it's, you know, I think, you know, open your mind, opening, open your mind and uh, try to understand each other is always very important in this world and then dip, you know, across different countries. Uh, just, yeah. if, just to follow up on that, if there's one Asian value that you could, that you think you could teach all Westerners, what would that value be? <laughs> oh, that's a very simple one. Huh? That's one of the sim more simple questions that if Yep. By the way, he's my son. <laughs> oh. He tried to challenge me. <laughs> I do. I want to know the answer, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do want to know the answer, though, uh, Jenny. Uh, he's studying in NYU, you know, in the arts. But it seems like a rhetorical question. Do you know, do you know the answer? You know the answer. I want to hear what my mom has to say about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The, you. She doesn't want to answer it publicly. Um, so as I talked to my friends at lunch today, because, you know, the... Uh, the one very um, popular sports in Western world is the boxing. And so boxing, it's all about speed, speed and heat and attack. I just want to talk about another, you know, the uh, equivalent sports in Oriental country is a Tai Chi. Tai Chi is all about when you attack me, I just try to, you know, avoid and uh, reduce your power and the strength. So this is the core value, I think, you know, it's a big difference and opposite between West and, West and the East. So uh, both, they are very strong. So I think, you know, the heat in the attacking is really strong, like uh, steel is really strong. And the water is all also a very strong, because dripping water can change the shape of rock. So it's a different form of strength. That's great. That's, that's fantastic, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, ye yesterday we had Nahiraka Mason, it said you need to run towards the dog, not away from it. So that was, a, I sort of compared that to it, no? So <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, that was a great remark. All right, I'm going to close it off. I think everybody has deserved a drink, um, some Inu and Kai. And um, yes, I want to thank all of you. Ngamihi kia koutou, ngamihi kia koe.
Mekwe, Mekwe. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Hannah. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Nico. Um, and thank you also to Nomadic Art Gallery. Um, and um, and uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. So this was the last of the three talks, and um, uh, I think it was uh, nice. I hope that we're gonna put it online, either on the Art Space Aotearoa website or somewhere through the Art Fair. I will talk with Stephanie about that, and um, I'm very keen to make this into a podcast if all the speakers agree, so that we can listen to it um, uh, once again. So um, thank you so much um, for coming, and have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Thank you. Kia ora.